I've been locked up 10, I'll be 10 years in January. Um. I grew up with a single mother who was strung out on crack and uh. Before I turned 12, I witnessed murders. I was smoking, I was drinking. Um, I shot my first gun, probably got 11. And everything I was doing was normal. Everybody around me was doing it. I never seen it as prison as bad. I never seen it as thing. I seen it as part of that life. This is what I was meant to live life. My father did it. My uncle, my uncle I'm named after did it. My mother's brother did it. My older brother did it. This is what it is. I know I understand what led me down this path. Poverty is a problem. It destroys families. It create a harsh reality for one to live in. So I like to say, um, knowing that the odds are against you, use this rage for motivation. Only then we'll be able to break the vicious cycle of racism and a modern day slavery was as dressed up as the justice system. In my hometown of Easton, Pennsylvania, Nothing stood taller than the jail on the hill. Every family had been touched by it. We all had tales of broken men in and out of lockup. I just assumed I would end up there too. My childhood friend Tommy spent most of his life in and out of jail. When I heard Tommy had committed suicide, I wanted to know more about a justice system that puts so many black men behind bars. The prodigal son, I climbed into my car and headed home. I grew up in. So this corner here is where I would catch the school bus and the first day I moved to this, um, to this house, I was standing on the corner and the paper boy walked by and called me a nigger. It was a f I think it was the first time someone called me a nigger. And his mother said, um, don't do that because those people burn our house down. Back in high school, my friends and I were already skilled in trading narcotics. Breaking and entering. We were taking what we wanted from rich, white college boys, unconsciously stealing back what had long ago been taken from us. I always drove the getaway car. My best friend Tommy rode shotgun. We were young and smart, rushing fast down roads leading us closer and closer to that ominous jail on a hill. I left Easton for freedom while Tommy stayed trapped in the prison system. Tommy's daughter Jerrica lived with him. Every day he got Jerrica ready for school. He cooked all her meals. Jerrica was 15 years old when her father committed suicide. Now, with Tommy gone, Jerrica struggles to find a reason to go on. He died alone, by himself. Like, I just, like, blacked out. That's what traumatized me, I think. It just didn't make sense. Because it was like, I just talked to him. He was just telling me what, what he's going to cook when I get home. And I got his tattoo name on my arm. So I feel like he's still, like, kind of still with me. Like, he's still there. I still talk to myself, talking to him. 
Like when I go to church, I feel like I'm talking to him sometimes. Of all my friends growing up, Tommy had the most discipline. He wasn't a thug. It didn't follow that he'd be the one who ended up in so much trouble. But that's the cruel catch of the system. It only takes one time. And the more Tommy went to jail, the more he started acting like a thug. Currently, we have 746 inmates. You know? So yes. you're over here. It's a little tense. It's loud. Your hair in the back of your neck stands up yeah. a little bit. You can hear a housing out at not too far away getting a little rowdy. What's going on? Uh, they're just, there's a few individuals that are maybe maybe having a verbal altercation right now. We have a few officers want to go check it out right now and see what's going on. You know? So if anything would happen to go, you know, if we happen to have a fight or anything, just make sure you step to the side. Although I knew the statistics, seeing so many black men in cages made me furious. So when did you get in here? Um, I just got in today. Today. Um, but I've, I'm obviously familiar with the system and how sometimes corrupt it can be or, you know, how messed up, you know, it can be for something so small to be something so big and something so long-lasting, you know? Tell, tell me about the system. Um, well, I mean, it just seems like everything that you do, like, no matter if you're a good guy, you know, it's, it's inevitable to end up here. It's been, you know, such a long process, you know, just coming in and out and just being part of the system now. It's just like, you feel like you're, you're never out, you know? Two years ago, Corday got a DUI. He spent five months in jail for driving under the influence, then had to pay exorbitant court and jail fees. He missed one payment. Then seven police officers broke down his door and arrested him. This DUI process has been, for me, it's been two years. You can be the good person, you know, and it only takes one mistake for you to be in a system. And once you're in, you're in. Corday wants to leave and get a fresh start elsewhere, but he's trapped in Easton because of an unending procession of probation and court appearances. I could have easily ended up yeah. on the, caught in, the, in a system yeah. like, Seriously. you know, like one in every three black men in America. Man, talk to the choir right now because I understand exactly what you're saying. And that sucks to, you know, for, for it to be like that, but I mean, it's the world we live in. And uh, you would think after years and years of, you know, integration and, you know, being equal to, you know, the next guy, the guy next to you, it would change, but it doesn't. Yeah. No, yeah. not yeah. at all. Corday's story is a lot like Tommy's. I know it would have been my story, too, if I hadn't got out of Easton. I got out, but my friends didn't. Growing up, I was very aware of being different. Long before I admitted the truth to myself, I bore the shame of homophobic bullying. I was called faggot in school all the time. My grandfather called me a sissy. As young as I was, I always knew no one in Easton would ever accept this thing about me. My safety, my very survival depended on how well I could hide my homosexuality from everyone, even Tommy. When I packed up and left home, it was in search of other people like me. In the 1980s, 
every closeted kid in every small town in America knew that gay people lived and breathed in the openly queer pulse of New York City. When I left Easton, I never looked back. The irony is, homosexuality may have saved my life. We thank you, Lord, for the resilience of the human spirit, for the resilience of this nation that out of the ashes we rise, out of the dust, Father God. Church was always a big part of our life growing up. Tommy played the drums in the band, and I sang in the choir. My biological father was a deacon from another church. When my mother and father met, they were both married to other people. They had an affair. My father chose not to acknowledge me as his son. I felt abandoned by him. After my mother left Easton, I had no reason to go back. Being there brings back all the demons I thought I left behind. Hi. Good to see you. I'm happy that you okay. came back to see everybody. Yes. You too. I have a nephew who's been incarcerated. Uh, he's gonna for he's gonna be in for 13 years. You're a correctional officer. Yes. yes. Wow. So where were you? At Sing Sing Correctional. You're at Sing Sing. Yes. Yes. After church, I had lunch with Tommy's family. How many of you know someone who's been in jail? Who do not Everybody. I've been in jail. I've been in jail. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Wait a minute. You've been in jail? Yeah. In the county jail? Lehigh mm -hmm. County. Yeah. Wow. Center. Where they center at? Mass incarceration has become an accepted part of life for poor people and black people in America. It is so entrenched in our nation's identity that we take it for granted and accept it as the norm. Its roots are buried deep in our troubled history. When slavery was abolished in America in 1865, the United States Congress created the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which essentially redefined the parameters of slavery. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist in the United States. This clause has allowed Americans to continue to enslave black people and poor people for over 150 years. Today, America has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Our jails and our prisons are mostly filled with poor people and people of color. Hey, Paul. Roger. Hi, Roger. Paul Wright, one of the most important advocates for prison reform, has himself served time in prison. I was, I was in prison because I shot and killed a drug dealer during an armed robbery. He tried to shoot me and I shot him. And But the point there was to get the point across to me that I shouldn't be uh, um, robbing drug dealers. They could have made that point without um, 17 years. And I was really surprised when I went to prison at basically the brutalization, dehumanization that prisoners are subjected to. And one of the things I thought about then in 1990, which 27 years later I still believe, is that if Americans knew what was happening in prisons and jails with their tax money and in their name, they would demand reform and they would demand change. The cost of running the criminal justice system is also enormous for the rest of us. State governments pour money into it, spending an average of 5% of their local budgets on correctional institutions. The federal government spends a whopping total of $265 billion a year, essentially paid for by taxpayers. But the question is, where does all that money go?
So tell me what you do and where we are. So I'm the executive director of the American Jail Association, the only organization uh, worldwide that we're aware of that focuses exclusively on the men and women who operate and work in our nation's jails. Right now we're on the show floor of our conference. This is where vendors showcase their products and services that are used in jails. Everything from clothing and food to medicine to security systems. If you run a jail, it's like running a city. Tell me about these chairs. Yeah, so one of, one of the manufacturers, Norix, uh, produces furniture for, for jails, for inmates. Uh, furniture like this, uh, made of plastic, so... Uh, you can wash it down. It, it can be easily maintained. Uh, no sharp edges, no way to take something apart and, and, and make a weapon out of it. Um, it's a comfortable, comfortable environment for, for an inmate. Um, we want to keep inmates comfortable. That's, that's not what I thought. The private company Norix is just one of many companies that profit from correctional institutions. Last year, their revenue was an estimated $22 million, much of it from this industry. I'm starting to see why this $265 billion a year industry makes it so hard to change the system. Basically, the United States has done a good job of creating a self-perpetuating prisoner machine. And you know, one thing to look at is um, their jobs depend on mass incarceration. And I think it was Sinclair Lewis that said it's hard to explain something to a man when his paycheck depends on him not understanding. To be fair, it's not just private companies. Yearly, $265 billion of our taxpayer money is spent keeping public prisons and jails running. Wages for correction employees alone are $38 billion a year. Healthcare costs are $12.3 billion. And $2 billion is spent on food. As it is, with all profiteering factions of any bureaucracy, no one wants to lose their piece of the pie. When they call it a prison industrial complex, it really... I, I hate that term. You hate that term, right? Why yeah. do you hate that term? Because don't look at it that way. I mean, we're not ma manufacturing automobiles. Um, we're not... Uh, no one profits from it. Jails don't have uh, shareholders. We're not trading oh, on Wall the Street. Companies, some of them. The companies that are part of all of them. $265 billion a year in taxpayer spending means a sure profit for companies like Securus, who charge hiked up fees for prisoners to use phones to call their loved ones. For individual families, it's not uncommon for them to pay upwards of $500 on average a month. But you're talking about the most economically vulnerable families in our society. So they are being weighted with the burden not only of a loved one who might have been the primary breadwinner. Now that breadwinner is gone, and now that family is in essence being overly taxed. Okay, we're talking about tune. a phone call. We're talking about a phone call. The fees that inmates pay for everyday services are several times what we pay outside of prisons. And companies like Securus continue to see their profits rise at the expense of disproportionately poor and black inmates. There are a number of companies that profit from the poor that end up getting locked up. Whether it be the telephone companies that profit from usurious telephone rates, uh, the companies that uh, manage financial flows to and from uh, people in prison and their families, uh, food service companies. There's a lot of money to be made in this industry. I'm also... Um, Complicit. Yeah. Yes. In this particular account, uh, you have three mutual funds, and we can look online, see what those mutual funds are invested in, and see if they are involved in some way profiting from the prison system. Okay. So, I'm looking for a Corrections Corp of America. And there it is. Yeah, it seems crazy, doesn't it? It's so mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's very warped. It, it may be time to tell your financial advisor that there are certain issues that you'd rather not be involved in. Yeah, yeah. And to think that I'm 
an investor in that, unknowingly, is even yeah. more disturbing for me. Because I, I keep going to people and saying, is this some giant conspiracy? Is it? And they're like, no, it's like everyone, it's just the way things are done. So from the prosecutors to the DAs to the judges to the magistrates, everyone to the, to the CEOs to the, they're just all part of a system that works. It's an industry. Yes, <laughs> although if you look back, you know, 10 or 20 years ago or, or longer, I think it was almost, uh, they knew kind of how it was going to end up, right? And they, they didn't scale that back. I think there were concerted efforts to not do anything about what was Why do you happening. think that is? Institutional structural racism. I think, I mean, that's the only explanation I can see. William G. Otis is a law professor and former federal prosecutor who was recently nominated by President Trump to the United States Sentencing Commission. Oh, I, as a conservative, I have, uh, you know, I have some misgivings about government's effectiveness and wisdom, but government doesn't get everything wrong. Every now and again, it will get something right. There are many more people in prison now than there were during the 60s and 70s. There are about 2.2 million people in, in prison. You get to mass incarceration not because of rising crime levels or crimes that people are committing, but also by criminalizing more and more behavior and more and more conduct. So it took the United States from 1776 to 1990 to lock up its first million people. Then the prison population doubled between 1990 and 2000. So it took us 10 years to lock up our second million. In the 1990s, prosecutors began prosecuting felony charges at twice the rate they did before. Um, what they point out less frequently is that we've gotten something for that. It is not a mistake. Uh, and it's not just a happenstance that we have so much less crime now than we did in the early 1990s. Why do you think America uh, I'm trying to understand why America has the largest incarceration rate in the world. Why do you think that is? It's the crime rate. That's what the crime rate affects us all, all 326 million Americans. And if you want to avoid incarceration, it's actually easy to do so. And you don't have to be a lawyer, and you only have to know four things to avoid incarceration. Don't steal stuff. Don't cheat people out of their property. Stay away from drugs and resolve your disputes without violence. If people follow those four rules, the prison population in this country will shrink to nothing. We have widening gaps of inequality in this country. And I view mass incarceration as a tool of social control. What are they controlling? Poor people. I mean, the criminal justice system in this country is literally, its only real function is containing and controlling poor people. What's the threat of poor people? Social change and political change. Poor men, poor men of color in particular are the foot soldiers of revolution and change in the world. And in this country, they're viewed as a threat. Our current incarceration crisis has its ugly roots in the unrest of the 60s and 70s. John Ehrlichman, counsel and assistant to President Richard Nixon, later admitted that the Nixon White House had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. And so, that's what they did. I think it's just a continuation of the deprivation and oppression that poor black people have suffered in this country for the last 500 years. What is needed is the right parenting, to teach the right values. Um, you know, I haven't met you before today, but I would bet a goodly chunk of change that you didn't become a successful person, an independent filmmaker, because your parents just let you run wild and didn't care about checking your homework. You avoid crime and you avoid scrapes with the police because your parents teach you to respect other people, to respect their right to be safe, and to resolve your disputes 
without violence. And if you want money, go earn it. Get a summer job. Bill Otis's ideas are very popular with the Trump administration. I will restore law and order to our country. And when you see these thugs being thrown into the back of a paddy wagon, you just see them thrown in, rough. I said, please don't be too nice. Like when you guys put somebody in the car and you're protecting their head, you know, the way you put their hand over. Like, don't hit their head and they've just killed somebody, don't hit their head. I said, you can take the hand away, okay? Donald Trump has decided that mass incarceration is a good thing and we need to increase the number of people in prison and increase prison sentences and turn back the clock on prison reform. Jeff Sessions, a relic of the racially segregated Jim Crow era from the South, is leading the charge to lock him up and throw away the key. Today I am announcing that I sent a memo to each of our United States attorneys last night establishing a charging and sentencing policy for this Department of Justice. But it is important to note that unlike previous charging memoranda, I have given our prosecutors discretion to avoid sentences that would result in an injustice. Sessions has told federal prosecutors to ask for the most serious charges and harshest sentences against defendants. I think our issue is reducing crime. I don't think we're, we're trying to get to a result uh, beyond that. I think that making sure that families throughout America are safe from the most violent and dangerous criminals, that is our number one priority and that's what we're focused on. Opponents of mandatory minimums or, or tough sentencing say that it disproportionately affects minority communities, but what they don't mention is that minority communities are the ones most disproportionately impacted by drug traffickers targeting those communities. And the crime in those communities, though they're the victims ultimately, and that's what we're trying to stop. Tough on crime ultimately benefits the communities that is victimized by crime the most. What the Department of Justice fails to acknowledge is that studies have shown that prosecutors are 75% more likely to charge black defendants with offenses that carry mandatory minimums. Though minority communities may be targeted, this does not justify the fact that following conviction, black defendants receive longer sentences for similar crimes. These racially informed micro and macro aggressions only prove that the prison system is biased against minorities and even more biased against poor communities of color. A recent study in San Francisco found that blacks accounted for less than 15% of stops, but over 42% of non-consensual searches, even though whites were more likely to carry contraband. I get stopped all the time. And when they stop me, they say to me, the cop always says to me, the state trooper always says to me, um, what do you do for a living? What role does race play when the cops pull over someone like me? Race plays a role. This is America. Race always plays a role. Um, if it's a white kid in a rich white suburb with a well-paid, uh, more sympathetic uh, police department that has to be more responsive to rich community concerns, absolutely the treatment is different. Um, Policing is local. Uh, the courts are local. Um, so all that matters. Um, and so again, we're talking about systemic problems of, of income inequality, of, of segregation. Uh, those problems are very real, um, but, it, but it seems like we don't want to focus on that. Adam Foss is a former prosecutor who is now one of the most outspoken voices for criminal justice reform. I saw this system playing out that uh, disproportionately affected people that look like us and in a really, really negative way. I, I actually got caught um, selling a lot of weed and I was doing it across state lines. So I was, it, was a federal, it was a federal crime, but um, I was caught by my father in my driveway and I was adopted by white people. And, and because of who he was in terms of being a respected community member and a police officer, um, nothing happened to me as a result. 
I got out of that. And then I just grew up and it didn't, you know, like I, it didn't happen when I was 19. It happened when I was 25, 26, 27 years old, went to law school and here I am. Adam often meets with a group of inmates. Most of them have life sentences for murder. I was raised by an immigrant mother who came to America from Cape Verde. And um, she wanted to pursue the American dream. None of that happened. So by the age of 12, I started selling drugs. At 17, I was charged with felony murder. The day before my 21st birthday, I was sentenced to a natural life. My mother, she was an addict. My pops, he was never around. And my stepfather, he was real abusive to my mother. So now I got this idea that my family's not, my, my parents who are supposed to love me, they don't love me. And not knowing how to process what was going on led me to, to, have, to portray that, or project that violence on others. So I took a life. Um, but at this point, I'm not the savage that I was when I took this young man's life, right? I'm educated, I'm civilized, I'm dignified. Um, and at this point, this sentence, man, is having like a reverse effect. What's the point? In prison, you're taught to put on body armor to keep people away and to protect yourself. And you kind of lose yourself in doing so because you have to create this militant individual. And I'm grateful of the mentors that we have. We start to see that forgiveness is a real thing. It's, it's helped me to see the positive things about myself and to be able to enhance it to where I can also see the positive things in other individuals who may not see it in themselves. The names that they use, killer, gangbanger, drug dealer, monster, nigger. They deal with their feelings by hating you, by prejudging you, and by labeling you. And it's really, really easy to do that when we stick you as far away from your community as possible, behind walls that we can't see over and neither can you. I've been with them for five years now, and I've seen what prison has done to them over the course of that five years. I mean, they've, gr they've grown, they've become men, they've um, really atoned through this restorative justice process, but you can see the patina of prison. That's been five years. Those guys have another 50 to 60 to go. Adam travels all over the country trying to change the way prosecutors think. There are 2.2 million people in jail and prison. And despite making up only 14% of the population, African Americans make up almost half of that number. It's not because African Americans commit more crime and it's not because we're all a bunch of bigots. It's because implicit bias rules our decision making. So we don't make decisions based on data and technology and things that are giving us a feedback loop. We make decisions based on our life experiences as individual prosecutors. One visit to a homeless shelter, one visit to a treatment center, one visit to a domestic violence shelter, to understand that there are things out there that we never learned in law school. The police, prosecutors, judges, and probation officers don't make a dime off of prisons. We have no incentive to send people to prison. The reason that we do is that that's the tool that we were told will make us safer and make people better. Prison is a supply problem. If they don't have the supply, they can't run their business. And they have no way, no way of actually taking people from the street and putting them in the building. It requires the police, it requires prosecutors, it requires judges, and it requires probation officers. The prison industrial complex could not exist without inmates. 
the entire prison industry would collapse without large numbers of people to incarcerate. To keep this $265 billion a year industry in place, there needs to be a pipeline to provide a steady stream of new people. People who are dispensable. In the history of forced labor in America, those without power have often looked different from those in power. Arresting those people who don't have power is the very first step in filling jails and prisons. When the police officer puts the handcuffs on a young black man, chances are he has entered the door of no return. The bureaucracy of mass incarceration has grown into a monster of many heads. Locking up large numbers of people began as a way to control black activists during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. In the 1980s, black behaviors were criminalized as the war on drugs focused on crack. By the 1990s, with widespread racist fear of super predators, there were so many people incarcerated that prisons became an industry. Now, that industry has become so lucrative, so far-reaching, that the moral issue is complicated by the financial issue. After the shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer in Ferguson, the U.S. Justice Department investigated. They found that the local government was using unnecessary fees and fines in order to extract large amounts of money from poor and black people. This investigation found a community where local authorities consistently approached law enforcement not as a means for protecting public safety, but as a way to generate revenue. The judge is the one who administers the final push in the prison pipeline. Incarceration, you know, it's sort of embedded in our society. That's sort of how we treat people. What, you know, a judge who's running for election has to say when he's on the stump. Yes. It's what, you know, right? And, and changing those is really hard. The worst of the worst, rapists, murderers, let off easily. Being weak on criminals is dangerous. Bill O'Neill expressed sympathy for rapists. It's no secret that being tough on crime looks good at election time for a judge. A recent study found that the more TV election ads there are, the more likely judges are to rule against criminal defendants. Probation is another reason why so many people are in jail. Probation officers used to be like social workers, helping inmates make the transition to life on the outside. But over the last 20 years, they've become more like law enforcement officers. So there are so many people sitting in jail for probation violations, which a lot of the time are not new crimes. 76% of prisoners who are released are rearrested within five years, many for probation violations. So when you go on probation, you have general rules that you have to follow. Let us know where you live. Let us know what your phone number is so we can contact you. Get employment, get housing. None of those things if I don't do them are crimes. If I choose to not have a job, that's not a crime. If I choose to hang out with my friends, that's not a crime. If I choose uh, not to get an education or to um, you know, smoke weed, those aren't crimes. And yet, as a prosecutor and as a probation officer, if you do those things while you're on probation, I can send you to jail. And that's, that's a uh, dirty little secret that we don't talk about is how that functions. I've met many others who are in jail simply because they cannot afford to get out. This modern day practice of punishing people for being poor is reminiscent of the inhumane debtor prisons of the past. What do you all, what can I ask what you're all in here for? Um, well, I'm, I'm in for DUI, my third, and I'm getting out in five days, but I've served a year, whole year. Um, this time it's for second offense DUI. How about you? I'm here because I owe $545 to domestics. The like, child support. My case was being closed, but I couldn't. I lost my job before I could pay the last payment, and I'm here for six months now. It's just backwards. It's Crooked County, I think. <laughs> it's a Crooked County? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Northampton is all about their money. You owe them $5, you better give them their $5. Okay. I was working. 
um, my living situation got messed up. I got kicked out. I had to quit my job, and now here I am. <laughs> Over $545 on a case that's going to be closed as soon as I leave here. I think most people don't know anything about the criminal justice system, right? They don't know that they're, they're not paying attention. They don't care because it's happening to somebody else. And often that person is a different skin color or ethnicity than they are. And they just think they did something wrong, all bets are off. But I also think if you talk to people and say, should you be paying for all your life for one disorderly conduct or, you know, should you be in jail for off and on for several years for writing one bad check or not returning a blockbuster movie? Nobody believes that. What's the motivation to keep the numbers up? You know, here's the thing. There's not one person who controls those numbers, right? The, the, dis the path to jail is made up of decisions by lots of different people, most of the time not in coordination with each other. So suddenly, the jail is full. It's a cruel cycle that often supplements the budgets of local governments as they extract unnecessary fees from people who can't afford to pay. As a person on probation, you pay the, the government to be supervised. So it's, it was $65 a month when I was a prosecutor. I think it's up to 90 at this point. But when you're a young black male who has no employment opportunities and you have kids and you have no education and you're caught selling drugs to make money, you go through all of this stuff, we make it harder for you to get a job, harder for you to get a house, harder for you to get any financial aid, harder for you to get services. And then you have to pay for that. And so what, what do you think is gonna happen? Like how, how did we, when we created this system, think this will be a good way to keep people from committing crime. When someone is convicted and moves from jail to federal or state prison, the government now has legal access to them as a workforce. These prisoners work for almost nothing, making road signs or mattresses or just about anything the government decides. The Eastern Correctional Facility is one of the oldest prisons in New York. Here, many of the prisoners are enrolled in a prison labor program where the inmates work for far below minimum wage. Some people see these programs as a good thing, training inmates for skills they can use when they're released, while others see it as modern-day slavery. Many of your Speed limit signs, your stop signs, your no U-turn signs, all the road signs you're seeing as you, as you drive down the road in, in, uh, on any typical journey. They make many of them right here. So what do they get paid? Uh, the, the pay rate ranges from about 15 cents an hour up to 65 cents an hour. What's the sort of motivation for not paying them minimum wage? Well, uh, wage and in, 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 uh, inmate pay rate is set by regulation. But you have to understand, a minimum wage employee in the community, uh, that's assuming that they're meeting all the financial demands of perhaps maintaining a household, a family, uh, and all the attendant fiscal responsibilities there. Purchasing of groceries, the, the housing costs, uh, transportation costs, health care costs. For an inmate who's uh, incarcerated in a correctional facility, those costs uh, are not realized by the inmate. For time spent within the penal system, inmates will accumulate fees averaging $13,600. Their families suffer huge financial losses in lost wages. By the age of 48, a former inmate will have earned $179,000 less than someone who has never been incarcerated. Every time that prisoners have gone to court, um, seeking to be paid for their labor, seeking to be compensated um, for their labor, the court's response is, you're slaves, you're slaves of the state. That's, those are the exact words of court after court after court for the last 120 years. Prisoners are slaves of the state, and as such, they're not entitled to any compensation at all. 
I read in prison legal news that companies like Victoria's Secret, Whole Foods, and Starbucks have used prison labor. Paul Wright exposed those stories. What percentage of prison labor is corporate America? Uh, it's actually pretty small. I mean, and I think that, um, you know, this may be bad for your story, but, but the reality is that there's, at any given time, there's around five to 6,000 prisoners employed by uh, the private sector in this country. But the truth is, most prisoners aren't working for private companies. They work for the government. Cheap labor keeps the prison system running. So what are they doing? Um, they're jobs? doing primarily what prisoners do is they run the prisons. So anything that prisoners, anything that has to get done in a prison, unless it's security related, usually prisoners are doing it. So um, they're doing plumbing, they're doing maintenance, they're, they're doing um, custodial and janitor services, cleaning. Um, they're cooking food, they're serving food. Literally anything you can think of that is needed to run a prison, prisoners do. So the prison saves a fortune by making the prisoners run the prison. Millions, mil tens of millions, yeah. They save tens of millions. There is a GAO report in 1993 that said it would cost prisons hundreds of millions of dollars more each year to pay prisoners minimum wage for the work that they did. So prisons are saving hundreds of millions of dollars by employing prisoners. And when, when we crunched the numbers, we found that the median wage in state prisons was 20 cents an hour. And the median wage in federal prison was 31 cents an hour. And in a number of states, they don't pay anything at all. Um, what? Yeah, oh yeah. In Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, and Alabama, prisoners are not paid for their work at all. And in some places, they're required to work under threat of disciplinary action. If they say, no, I'm not gonna work, they can write you up for that, they can send you to solitary for that. Well, that's, that's, that's slavery. In the prison labor debate, we rarely hear from inmates. What do you say when pe people say, oh, they shouldn't have labor programs in prisons? No, I, I don't agree with that whatsoever, you know, because look, I can be out there just walking the yard. You know what I'm saying? I can be out there just angry, but this is a buffer. This gives me an incentive, you know what I'm saying, to want to do the right thing, to do something different. The pay can be a lot better. I'm pretty sure someone's making more money off it, you know? They just, they just gonna pay you what they feel that needs to be paid. Once you're arrested, you have to wait in jail until trial unless you pay bail. Tommy's sister Susie told me that bail was a huge financial burden on their family. I understood more when I saw how bail works. The court sets bail, and if you pay it, you get to go free until your trial. But the average bond amount is $55,000. That's more than a year's wages for most people. Most states in this country have what's called a right to bail. That, that's been perverted in two ways. The first is that money has become not just the primary, but almost the only way that people can get out of jail. And so the number of people who are sitting in jails across the country because they can't afford bail is really, really depressing. What you can do is if a bail is set that you can't afford, you can go to a bail bondsman. And the bail bondsman will front you the money. So say a judge sets your bond at you know, $50,000. You know, the average person doesn't have that kind of money lying around. They might, however, have $5,000 lying around. So if you can pay a bail bondsman 10% of your bail, um, they will front you the rest. Almost every state has a bail bond industry. And what happens is these bail bondsmen um, form very powerful lobbying interests, and they will, um, they will lobby at the state house. So anytime the issue of bail reform comes up, you can be sure that um, the bail bond industry's lobbyists are there um, pushing to maintain uh, the money bail system how it is. From 2002 to 2011, the bail lobby spent $3.1 million to influence lawmakers. It makes sense why the bail lobby wants to stop reform. Arrested people pay over $1.4 billion a year to the bail industry. That's over a billion dollars annually being sucked out of mostly poor communities. I'm not so crazy as not to know that you've already figured out that if I can talk you into doing this bill, 
my clients are going to make some money on the bond premiums. Like, instead of playing with dolls and having a normal little kid childhood, like, I wish everybody else could have. I used to, like, have to hide beer and, like, beg the cops not to take my dad, and it was bad. So I used to, like, cry so they didn't take my dad, and then, because when they took my dad, me and my brother would just, like, like, it was just not, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It was bad. Sis, how much time did Tommy spend in jail? A think? lot. A lot. Tommy... Like every month, every mm, couple it months? It was more than every month. Um, so the jail never got him any help or treatment. They would just throw him in jail. they just throw him in jail. But what they did was they put him in what they call a bubble up there um, if they think you're suicidal. And, they, and they, I guess they put you in a paper gown and you're up there and as pe other people in the prison are in there, they can walk past and see you there in Northampton? in Northampton County. But he was in there for quite some time. They kept him medicated. He was so medicated that a lot of times he didn't know his name if you called it. But this went on for years. It went on literally for years. If Tommy were alive, it would break his heart to see what is happening to his daughter, Jerrica. She has missed so much school that she might have to drop out. So dark. The psychological trauma of jail isn't just shouldered by the person in prison. The families of the incarcerated bear much of it, too. Watching Jerrica weep for her father triggered a deep well of sorrow I shoulder as a black person living in America. The system exploited Tommy. He might still be alive if the courts were designed to rehabilitate instead of criminalize. One of my best friends from um, high school, Tommy. Tommy spent his whole life in and out of the county jail. He never got any treatment. And I didn't understand how that could happen. And I wonder how many other Tommies there are. You're right, there's a lot of Tommies out there. I mean, they should not be spending time inside of our institutions. They need to be inside of hospitals where help can be provided. Mental illness is real, and there's a real problem inside, inside of our jails. In Miami-Dade, 62% are classified with some type of mental illness. So if we figure out a way to treat that issue or divert them into the proper uh, resources in the community, then our numbers go down and we can better service those inmates that are inside of our system for something other than that. That's a massive number and I had no idea. Jail serve, they serve a need because there are they're, they're ills in our communities. We understand that. And there's some bad people out there, I get that. But less, not everyone needs to be in jail. I mean, jail should be the last stop for an individual that who we've, we've exhausted all means as a society. And you know, if you look at it just from dollars and cents, would you prefer to pay a jail system $200 a day in order to house this person? Would you prefer, and, and them returning them back to you within a matter of days sometimes? Or would you prefer to spend your money on a diversionary program or a mental health scenario where they can get the treatment and they'll never end up in that street again? So it's costing us money. It's costing you money. I would, I would argue that it costs you more money to house the wrong person inside of a jail system than to get that same individual treatment. It's kind of like, you must have the only job where if you're, if there's, if you're out of, if you guys are out of work, it's probably a good thing for society. Absol absolutely. Isn't, isn't that kind of weird? That'll be a pink slip I'll gladly accept. How much of your job when you were a police officer did you spend dealing with mental health issues, people with mental health issues? Significant part. I mean, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell, especially when it overlaps with alcohol and with drugs, but also just general family crises. I wish police didn't have to deal with people in mental crisis. Um, yes, cops could and should be better trained in dealing with mental issues, but at some level, I don't think that should be the officer's job. The idea that we've even equated mental health care and is linked to mass incarceration 
is again another moral strike against us as supposedly civilized, humane people. Can you imagine a worse treatment program than jail? The correlation between mental illness and incarceration is truly frightening. Starting in the 1970s, the numbers for mental hospitalization plummeted while the incarceration rate of people with mental health issues skyrocketed. It shouldn't be the responsibility of the justice system actors anyway to be the primary, the first responder for people with mental illness, for people who are self-medicating with alcohol or drugs because of depression or trauma or all this kind of stuff. It shouldn't be the criminal justice system, but that's what we've got. And so a lot of the work around reform is how do we make that system better at spotting those folks and finding alternatives to get them out. The name my mother gave me been replaced with a stock number. So we ask if slavery still exists. <laughs> the amount of punishment go, crosses a threshold and becomes vengeance. And when it crosses that threshold, it starts to impact us in a way that's, that was not the intent. I'm no longer um, sorry. I'm no longer remorseful. Now I'm angry and my anger manifests into violence, and now I'm worse than I ever was when I came in. What is the jail for, right? Come to a decision, then say, all right, let's look who we've actually caught in that jail. And if those don't match up, how do we get those people out? And so there are a whole bunch of things that can be done at each of these decision points. Up to a certain point, incarceration deters crime, and then after that point, it either um, doesn't deter any further crime, or in fact, it causes more crime. We seem to spend a lot of time and money trying to make people a lot worse. And I think that comes down to one of the core things is I think the real purpose of American prisons is really to destroy people, destroy them as individuals, destroy them as functioning members of society. I'm terrified of what the criminal justice system will look like after this administration is done. I think it is imperative that people in power hear stories like Tommy's or Corday's or any of the men in the restorative justice program. I keep coming back to the jail on a hill. It breaks my heart to know that all over America, countless black people, countless poor people, without the power to decide their own fate, are cuffed and carted up a hill to be disappeared from public view. Inside, they are stripped of their dignity and denied their humanity. The cumulative cost is enormous in lost dollars, in lost opportunity, and lost lives. If we allow this cruelty to take place away from our gaze, we compromise our humanity. If we're able to look at it as it is happening and do nothing, we become inhuman. We cannot turn away from what we have done.